Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Uh, welcome to this fun Fellowship Friday night for the Church of the Eternally Secure uh, CES. And remember the Zelda episode. I apologize on about starting. Who can uh, looks like we're 13 minutes behind schedule. Uh, uh, it's just taken a while for uh, uh, everybody to join us, and still we don't have everybody with us. But uh, right now we've got uh, Brother Ben, Sister Heather, and myself. And Sister Lisa has been joining us, except that uh, she has some technical problem, and hopefully she'll be able to get that resolved, but she's trying. And Sister Angel sent us a message that she's coming, but she's running behind, so she, she should be with us here soon. Uh, and I haven't heard anything from Brother Steve, uh, so that's that's why we were just waiting to see if we could get the whole panel together before we started. But... Uh, Everybody in the congregation, thanks for being there and being patient with us. Sister Renee is here. By the way, Renee, uh, you know, you're always welcome to join us if you want to join us. Uh, looks like we're short-handed, uh, and uh, it would be a good time for you to join us if you're able, okay? So um, keep that. Let us know, Angel. I mean, <laughs> Angel. Renee. <laughs> Sorry. Um, all right. Let's say hello to the congregation. Uh, Sister Heather. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's had a good day. Um, just happy to be here and looking forward to having some fun this Friday night. Mm -hmm. Fun, yeah. Well, uh, let's, that that should be our goal. I really, I really think that uh, that is the primary reason for the Friday night program. Let's let's have some fellowship together and. You know, not only is it going to be focused on the the Bible, uh, but uh, uh, we're going to try to do it in a way that we're going to have some fun while we're at it. Uh, let's see if we can succeed at that. Brother Ben, you got anything fun to tell us? <laughs> yes, it's good to be here. I'm delighted to be here. I think we have a great set of questions, or true false statements, rather, uh, mostly uh, because of Heather. <laughs> Heather. Um, and Renee, if you want to join, feel free. I sent you a, 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 an email. Um, so if you want to join, uh, you're, uh, you're welcome, more than welcome to. We're short a few people. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm ready to go. Okay. All right. So it uh, looks like uh, we've got uh, Brother Kevin there uh, as a moderator. Thank you for being there, Kevin. And you've been doing an excellent job. Um, um, for us uh, dealing with uh, the, first of all, greeting the people in the chat room and, and then dealing with the trolls. We've had uh, kind of uh, the last few programs, the trolls have come back. So if we didn't have um, Kevin and Heather, uh, Brother Hendricks and some others uh, to deal with it, we couldn't function because we really can't concentrate on, uh, you know, our program at the same time, try to deal with all the problems that uh, in the chat room. So uh, we, we really couldn't do without you. So thank you. Um, all right. Uh, anything you want to say before we uh, get into the um, um, true false questions, uh, Heather or Ben? Nope. I think I'm ready. Okay. All right, then, Ben, why don't you give us the first question? Okay, actually, I'm going to, uh, I want to, uh, I'll wait till Angel gets here. Uh, she says she might be a little late because I was going to do her question first, but I'll hold off on that one. Um, and so, let's go with this one. This is Heather's, and it is, true or false, God expected Israel to live perfect lives according to the letter of the law. Hmm. <clears throat> well, I'll go ahead and answer it. I, uh, no, I don't think God expected Israel to live perfect lives. I mean, I'm obviously God uh, uh, is omniscient, so he, he certainly knew that they were not going to do it. And, and he certainly kn knew that they were not even capable of doing it, even if they really diligently try, tried. Um, 
And the, um, the, the purpose of the, the laws that were given to Moses and Israel were um, um, so that if they were following the law, uh, at least the better they followed the law, the better that the outcome for their lives would be in terms of being blessed. So, um, yeah, it, it was there to uh, be helpful to them so that they wouldn't, uh, uh, you know, the, not only the chastisement of God, but also reaping and sowing. These principles will uh, 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 would be affecting Israel and, and uh, the way that they could not have a negative outcomes to deal with is to follow these laws. And a lot of people, I've had some non-believers ask me about some of the commandments that were, well, why? Why do you have all these commandments and rules? And uh, I don't believe, uh, let's, let's take, for example, um, um, adultery or if fornication and these things, uh, because a lot of people, uh, especially uh, today, because of the, you know, the sexual revolution that, uh, we went through as as I was growing up. Uh, my generation was quite rebellious and re re resisted, you know, the, the the traditional rules of society. And you know, there was a our slogan was "sex, drugs, and rock and roll." But um, so people wonder, well, why why do you have to do that doesn't it seem, doesn't it ridiculous why can't a person just have as much sex as they want and and, and as much many sexual partners as, as they want and, and uh it, it's it's not because uh god says oh i'll make sex so appealing to people and give them such a drive that you know so they're they're thinking about it they're almost obsessed with it and and make it so pleasurable and then tell them no you can't do that I mean, that would seem kind of frustrating and, and almost cruel. Uh, so I believe the, the, the reason is that God is not trying to spoil our fun when he says, don't do these things. What, what he's doing is saying, don't do these things because you don't realize that if you do have sex outside of a, a marital relationship, that there are going to be some negative consequences some actually quite destructive consequences to the family unit. Um, you have uh, broken families, uh, divorce, uh, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, all kinds of uh, consequences. So uh, for our own good, God tells us, do this, don't do that. And uh, it's not just because God is a legalist and just wants to give us a lot of rules. Uh, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> now I don't even know if that was pertinent. But okay, uh, uh, better Heather. Well, oh yeah, Heather, you wrote the question. So Ben, why don't you go next? Oh, Renee's here. Okay, welcome, Sister Renee. I hope you're not. Hey. Have... Hey. Yeah, there you are. All right. I'm so glad you could uh, join us. Uh, you could see that we were. Uh, very short-handed tonight. So thanks for for uh, being here. Yeah, uh, I missed the question though. I was trying to sign okay. in. Well, I answered the question, but I can't remember what it was. So Ben, why don't you repeat the question for Renee? Okay. okay. the The question is: God expected Israel to live tr true or false. True or false? God expected Israel to live perfect lives according to the letter of the law. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's term, isn't it? Okay, yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, well, I think, Luke, you, you summed it up well. I mean, uh, I think God gave the law, basically. I think there's a lot of verses that speak to this. I can't find the one in particular that uh, I'm looking for, but um, there's one in like Deuteronomy 30, or Deuteronomy 12, 28. It says, Observe and obey all these words which I command you, that it may go well with you and your children after you forever when you do what is good and right in the sight of the Lord your God. And I think there's another one that says, you know, for the, uh, your obedience so that uh, to the commandments is so that it will be well with you in the land. Um, so it, it's speaking about earthly um, principles so that it can be, you know, the, the law is good. 
Um, but it was very strict as well. Uh, but even even under the law of Moses, there was uh, you know there was there was mercy um, and forgiveness. But um, again, I think I think uh, no, God didn't didn't expect people to live perfect lives. Uh, if he if he expected to live perfect lives, he wouldn't have given the law at all. Because if they were righteous, there's no re the right the law is not for a righteous person, but it's for uh, evildoers, people who are, you don't trust, people you 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 know have a propensity. Uh, to do evil, so um, the, the fact, the very fact that they were under the law, uh, tells us that God did not trust them, uh, and that they needed uh, uh, direction. They didn't. They weren't going to naturally do what was right and what what was holy and righteous. So that's why He gave the law so that uh, they could live and in, in, uh, prosper in the land. Um, so that ultimately, uh, His ways and His witness uh, and 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 His Messiah could come into the world. Um, I think that's the the, the primary um, intent of the law. Okay, thank you, brother. Uh, I I don't see the link in the chat room. Uh, did you forget to post it, or am I? I looked several times for it. Okay, I'll post it again. I, I was wondering why no one uh, voted. Maybe I forgot to submit it. I'll post that so I can make it, record my vote, uh, and and then we'll go to. Uh, looks like Sister Lisa's here too. Lisa, let's just see if you got your audio working now. Are you there? Can you hear me now? Oh yes. yeah. Oh, we hear, right. you, we hear your velvety voice. <laughs> oh. Praise the Lord! Awesome. I had to use a different browser. That seemed to be what the issue was. Yeah, awesome. Well, uh, Sister Renee is with us tonight too. So. Uh, Let's um, let's have Renee answer the question, and uh, Ben, would you repeat it again, just in case uh, Sister Lisa hadn't heard it yet? Yes. Yeah, I didn't get it. Thank you. True or false? God expected Israel to live perfect lives according to the letter of the law. All right, Sister Renee. Yeah, I I will say true. Uh, but as you stated, it was not for salvation. It was for the preservation of the nation and also for the nation to be a holy nation uh, for the Savior to be born through. Now, perfect as in the letter of the law, not in the heart of the law, because sinful man, no matter how strict he lives, it, he still is not fulfilling uh, the law, fulfilling and keeping it to the letter are two different things. Uh, you can keep it to the letter in the sense that you're not actually committing the physical act, but in your heart, you could desire it. That's why man in his sinful state, Paul talks about how uh, uh, it was, uh, first it says it was added because of transgressions to, you know, to show us our need for a savior. Uh, and the the reason men thought they were righteous is because they were keeping the letter of the law. But Jesus upped the standards and showed him, if you hate your brother, uh, it's like you're a murderer. So in God's eyes, even if you don't commit it under the dead letter, you still have not fulfilled it uh, because of our sinful flesh. It says that because if of the law was given that could have brought life fairly righteous and it would have been by the law but because of the infirmity of our flesh the weakness of our flesh that our sinful state that we inherited it was not possible only jesus fulfilled the law but as far as israel uh being expected to live perfectly by the letter yes they were because there were many of these that were under a death penalty um, but the point of the law, uh, was one to be a holy nation for the savior to be born through. They were supposed to be different than the world Two, to make every man guilty before God, uh, so that they would understand their need for a savior and three, so that we would understand what God's real standards are, what he considers, uh, the right way. Um, so, uh, yes, he did expect that because this nation was a set apart nation that was supposed to have standards higher than the rest of the world. 
Sadly, many of them thought that they were righteous or had uh, the promise of eternal life because of it. Uh, and we see that that is not true. Um, uh, because Jesus told them, you seek the scriptures and in them you think you have eternal life. But they are which testify of me. So, um, yes, in uh, the practical sense, they were expected to keep the letter of the law, but they uh, did not fulfill it, no matter how good they lived, because of the weakness of their flesh. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, sister. Um, all right, Ben, I still don't see it. So I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you paste it in there, if it, for some reason it's not allowed. Yeah, it. YouTube, for some reason, it just, it's not telling me this, but it, it, when I paste it in there, it just goes off into the ether. It, does, it goes off into, into a vacuum. Uh, I could to pipe everything else, but anytime I post a, a link in the chat, it just disappears. So I'll, yeah, I'll keep they're, they're doing that now. That okay. I've, I've had problems with posting links too. Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. Hopefully, if it's not a YouTube link, unless it's a YouTube link, they don't want you referring to anything that's not YouTube. Okay. All right. Well, I guess we'll have to uh, adapt. All right. Sister Lisa, let's hear your answer. Yeah, I was listening very astutely, but I'd like you to repeat the question one more time. Hey, Ben. Sure. Sure. Uh, it is true or false. God expected Israel to live perfect lives according to the letter of the law. Thank you. I just wanted to make Ben work. Um, <laughs> that's a running joke between me and Ben. He did, yeah, messing with him. But uh, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna answer this a little bit different. I think. Because, okay, if we look at the perspective from God, did he expect it, knowing they couldn't keep it? I mean, he's God. He knew they couldn't keep it, so why would he expect it? I don't think that would have been a reasonable expectation. So I'm wondering about this because I wonder what would, what would have happened had they approached him like we have to do under grace as a little child. And when... Moses had, had laid out these different things and they said, remember, they said everything the Lord has said, we will do. So I wonder if that was an arrogance instead of going, you know, uh, Lord, I'm not sure we can do that. I'm not sure we can keep it. What would have happened had they been like a little child and been honest? We can't do all of that. I don't know. <laughs> what if we fail? I don't know. I'm, I'm wondering about that because he's God. He knew they couldn't keep it. Then he immediately, once they, once they make that declaration, he tells them to stand back. He didn't tell them to stand back before that. So I wonder about that. I don't know that that would have been a reasonable expectation for God to expect that they could keep it. Uh, maybe their attitude wasn't right. I don't know. They kept going, <laughs> they kept going into bondage because they couldn't keep it. From that point. So I truly wonder about that. And then when we look at what the revealed. The revealed promises. Which is Christ. Who is the propitiation for our sin. I wonder what would have happened if they said, Lord, we don't think we can do it. You know, like a little child, if you give them too many instructions all at once, you know, that little blank look they get on their face. Like, I don't know about that. I don't think I can do it. <laughs> so um I, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say leaning false. I don't think God had any expectation that they could do it. And that in their exuberance or pride or arrogance or error, however you wanna however you wanna say it, I wonder what would have happened if they would have just said, Lord. We can't do it. Would grace have entered in right then at that moment? I don't know. I wonder about that. I don't think it would have been reasonable for the Lord to expect that they could do it when we ourselves can't keep it. And you see the arrogance of people who do that to this day. They go, oh, I, uh, I, I keep all the law. And we all look around going, now, do you really think they're telling the truth? 
No, our attitude is to keep it. We want to keep it. But we see that the law actually required perfection. And how are you going to be perfect when you're a sinner? When I'm a sinner, there's no way to be perfect. So we see when Jesus came, he revealed to them, you must be perfect. So I, I don't think it's I don't think it's accurate to say that the Lord expected them to keep it. I think that's false. So that's my answer. I gave the reasons why. OK, thank you. Well, um, that that's one of the points that I made in, in my answer that uh, uh, since God's omniscient, and he knew that they were not going to be able to do it. He said, well, how could he expect them knowing that they couldn't do it? But uh, listening to Renee's answer, I, I think that uh, there's uh, this idea of expecting really we could look at it both ways and that he expected them in saying hey i'm not doing i'm not issuing these laws just for the fun of it i expect you to try to do it and i you know follow it but of course he knows that they're going to fail because they couldn't it's impossible for them to do it perfectly um all right let me see uh sister heather you are the troublemaker that issued this question <laughs> So let's hear, let's hear your official answer. All right. Well, you're you're probably going to love this one because I am going to tie everybody's answers together. Um, I have learned a lesson through homeschooling that has given me great wisdom on this subject. Um, you know, when God first presented a law of any kind, it was ten commandments, and the Israelites looked at each other and said um <laughs> realizing that they would not be able to do it but that in their very best effort they were going to try and do it so god said you think you can do that okay well here's a few more and now they're up to i think it's like 613 here's here's how this ties in with homeschooling for me my son when I'm when I'm trying to get him to learn a new way to do math, because, you know, we're since we're homeschooling, we're trying to come as far away from that common core nonsense as possible. So we're getting back to the old school, the way that mommy learned how to do math. And my son is a genius anyway when it comes to math. But when he struggles to understand something, he might have five questions that he's got to answer for the teacher because we do have a teacher we work with. But if he's struggling so much that he's he can't get through those five, I pull out one of my home homeschool books and I give him more to do. And he's like, it's not fair. I don't understand. If I couldn't do the five, why are you giving me more? And I tell him, sweetheart, sometimes we just need to practice before we can learn to do it. And in God's immense wisdom, he gave them extra work to do because he knew they couldn't do the work that he had already given them and they needed to practice. And on top of that, when Jesus came, he gave them even more work to do by expounding on their practice because they weren't doing it right. And I believe that what Lisa said is so true. If they had just said, we can't do this, it's too much. We can't do it by ourselves. That grace would have entered there, but they didn't because they, in their pride and in their arrogance, they thought we will do this so well that no one will be able to condemn us. But in trying to do it, they were condemning themselves. And I just think it's a beautiful, beautiful lesson. And by the way, before I submitted that question, I was not dealing with the homeschool issues, but um, listening to everybody's answers, yes, I think that God wanted them to do it. And did he think that they could do it? No, probably not. But I think he wanted them to for a lot of reasons. And I think Renee covered uh, quite a few of those. Um, there was the, the um, you know, like cleanliness laws and stuff like that, that Nobody back then knew anything about germs, but we do now. Nobody knew anything about washing your hands, but we do now. They did it. They they would they would use a specific hand for 
you know, cleaning themselves and then they would use the other hand to eat. So the fact that fact alone tells you that they didn't have any clue about how to maintain cleanliness. So I think that God did that, gave them those laws for protection. Um, But yes, I think he wanted them to try, but I also think that he knew that they would fail. Awesome. Thank you. Well, um, you know, our, our uh, let's say our protocol is uh, uh, everybody answers the question and then we have time for follow up. Uh, so does anybody want to add more to their answer now that you've heard everybody and you have more time to think about it? Uh, anybody want to? Uh, yeah, I do. Go ahead, sister. Yeah, I, I want to say on the bat, I uh, agree with Lisa in the sense that God already foreknew. I think everybody in here knew that God foreknew uh that that they would not keep it perfectly i mean upon uh hearing the law before it was brought down they while moses was gone to get the tablets they uh broke the first one after claiming they could do it um you know with the golden calf and so forth and the bible tells us the strength of sin is the law uh and that it was added for transgressions. It was so that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God to be a schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ. And so I think Lisa picked up on the point that God's whole purpose of this thing, I, I believe is for several reasons. Like I said, they were a holy nation and there were some uh, laws, the, the sacrifices and so forth pointed toward uh, Christ. But, you know, the animal sacrifices were also in place because God foresaw that they wouldn't keep them. So they had to make sacrifice for those sins. Even at their best, they would still fail. Um, and again, I believe there's a difference between fulfilling the law and uh, and keeping the dead letter of it. Uh, because I don't think it makes much difference to God if, if you're... You, you really want to kill somebody, but you just don't because, you know, you're not supposed to, you know, it, 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 a heart change is needed in that instance. But I agree with her in that if they would have just cried out, we like what we got from you, God, we like the grace you've shown us since we left Egypt. Can we just stay there with you providing for us? <laughs> Can we just hang out there for a while? We like how that. But um, instead, they did. They boasted. Oh, yes, all these we can keep, just like the rich young ruler. So uh, although I, I would like to clarify this question, though, did God expect them to keep it? Per- yes. Did he expect they would? No. The whole pur- a purpose of expecting them to keep it perfectly is the exact point. They can't. Uh, so, you know, uh, it still amazes me. Was it Lisa that was saying all these people claim and they still keep the law? It, it's amazing to me, the people that, that do this every day, because every one of us on this uh, panel, I, I, I guarantee if we sat down and looked at the dead letter, we could probably say, yeah, I didn't commit that. No, I didn't break that. No, I didn't do that. And we could go around boasting, we keep the law too. But for some reason, they they think those of us with grace, even though grace teaches us to deny ungodliness, uh, which they don't seem to understand, um, you know, they don't keep it any greater than we do. Uh, And that's what's amazing to me is that they're they're that blinded by spiritual pride and they they can't see it. So, yeah, I think he... uh, expected it because he knew they couldn't absolutely that's that's the whole point isn't it so that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty to be a schoolmaster to bring us unto christ yeah amen one of the things that i am uh, really uh thankful for uh, of all of jesus's teachings is uh when he uh ratcheted the, the law he and, and tightened it and, and and so that no one can wiggle their way out of it Amen. so he said not only are you guilty if you do it but if you even think about it then you're guilty you already committed it in your mind so that really uh gives a, nobody 
should be able to honestly, sincerely think and, and claim that they've been able to follow the law. If your hand like offends, brother Luke, plug mm -hmm. it out. If your hand, if it's better to cut off a body part than to go into hell, how are you going to cut your heart out? How are you <laughs> Be in pieces. They did do that to me. They cut my heart out. <laughs> they did ratchet it down, like you said. <laughs> they still can't, Brother Luke. They still can't see what Jesus is doing there. And those verses trouble people when they get to them, and it yeah. break them into pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Luke. really. What they were doing is um, the uh, this, this term that we've. I like to keep repeating easy legalism. That's what they were doing is that they were being able to claim that, oh, I follow the law. Look, like as the rich young ruler, as you said, there's an example of saying person actually believing that he's been able to follow the law and that's easy legalism. And so, hey, Jesus said, no, 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 no. You're, uh, you don't realize that, that just because you did this and you didn't do that, that you, that doesn't mean you follow the law. But you, it, you, your thoughts, and you know uh, that makes you guilty, whether you did it or not. So go, go ahead, Sister Lisa. Yeah, I was going to say one other thing that I wanted to add is, in God's foreknowledge and knowing that they couldn't keep it, there was still a purpose in that, uh, and that is, Israel was set apart to be an example to the world, in the KJV. Uh, the old English word that's used there is in sample, which is basically the same as example. Uh, and you'll see numerous scriptures like in, uh, let's see, I think this is Philippians 317, brethren, be followers together of me, mark them which will walk. So as ye have, as <clears throat> have us for an example, in sample, uh, and there, there are several other scriptures that talk about in samples. They were an example. So even though they didn't keep it, it was an example to the world <laughs> that they were still his designated people. There was a price to pay for, for not following it. Even in the curses that were levied out against them, it was as an, a testimony to the world that these are God's people. And this is what happens if you don't follow it. His instruction. So all of this was laying down the foundation for where we are today to even be able to go back and look at for now. So even in their in their disobedience, it was an example to the world of and them not being able to keep it as a reminder for us to not get puffed up in our flesh and that we need the Holy Spirit. That's the Bible. In fact, the Bible says in the new covenant that the only way that we we don't walk or, or fulfill the lust of the flesh is to walk in the spirit. <laughs> so the only way to not fulfill the lust of the flesh, which then brings you against the law and brings you into transgression, is to walk in the spirit. So uh, even knowing in his foreknowledge that they couldn't keep it, there was still a purpose in it. And And as we know, Paul lays out so beautifully in Romans and in other places that it was to bring man to an end of himself so that one would not be lifted up in pride we're supposed to have the attitude and humility of a, of a little child and and that is to throw our hands up with reckless abandon and say lord i need you i need all of you <laughs> every day all the time to, to get me through that, that's all i have to say yeah thank you yeah i i think that there was a twofold uh, purpose of the, those laws for israel and one was God saying, um, "I need you to do these things and don't do these things for your own good. You'll you'll be your life will be better. You'll be blessed if you do this, and if you don't, then there will be consequences that you really uh, will regret." Uh, but then the other purpose, of course, is to show them their helplessness. That they, hey, you you're not able to to follow it perfectly, no matter how much you try. So now maybe you'll understand why uh, you're going to need someone to save you because you, you're you're not able to accomplish it on your own. Uh, hey, then, go Howard, ahead. Howard wrote something in the chat was interesting. In John 7, 19, Jesus himself says, Moses gave you a law, yet none of you keep it.
That was a good point he made. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, ben or Heather, would you like to add any more? I, I'd like to add something real quick. Um, you, you guys all had amazing answers uh, and really, uh, really helped round out my, my uh, view on it as well. But one thing I think is very interesting, especially when, uh, Lisa, you said about, you know, had they said uh, to God when God gave them the law at Sinai, when they uh, when, when the law was ratified, so to speak, you know, had, had they cried for mercy, would have God relented? And I believe he would have. In fact, the fir early, the very first uh, taste of the law or uh, type of the law of the covenant they're about to enter into occurs in, in, in Exodus 15. And right before that, uh, you know, God had graciously sent Moses to deliver them from Egypt. Uh, he split the the Red Sea open graciously through his miraculous powers. Um, he drowned Pharaoh's army uh, miraculously. And so, again, it was delivery after delivery, purely on his grace. And yet, and, and even right after that, uh, Miriam uh, led the people in, in a song and dance. And one of the, one of the lyrics of that song were... Uh, verse 13 in Exodus 15, it says, you, you in your mercy have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. And it goes on. But right after that, they, um, they were wandering, uh, again, in the same chapter, immediately after that song, uh, not, so, not long after that, they forgot. They were forgetful. Uh, that's another thing that the flesh does. It's very forgetful. Uh, the, there's constant reminders in the Bible not to forget. But uh, right at verse 22 of that same chapter, um, again, they, they, it says Moses brought them from Israel, from, brought Israel from the Red Sea, and then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went there three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter, which is a picture of the law. The law is bitter. Therefore, the name of that place was called Marah. And the people complained, grumbled, against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? Again, drinking uh, from the rock is a picture of Christ um, and, and eternal life. Um, but this this was the uh, the first instances. This was the first instance of Israel's uh, wilderness complaint. So there there were it basically typified uh, Israel's uh, uh, continuing continuing to uh, rebel and, and grumble against uh, Moses, who was uh, was who was God essentially to them. I mean. Um, he was God's representative. So when they're you know, when they're grumbling against Moses, uh, they knew that they were grumbling against God, and so and so Moses cried out to the Lord, and he showed him a tree. And that word "showed" there, showed him a tree. Again, picture of uh, the tree is a picture of Christ. Uh, and by the way, uh, every time Mo Israel ever delivered, it always preceded by them crying out for mercy. So Moses cried out on their behalf, showed him a tree, and that word "showed" there. Is the same term that is used for the uh, for the word in the Torah for law. It, it they showed him like the law shows you your your uh, who you really are, which is a, a sinner. And uh, and Moses cast the the tree into the waters, and the waters became sweet. Obviously, a picture of Christ again. Um, and and then okay, so again they failed to see God's they failed to see God's mercy. You know, being delivered after delivery after delivery. And they instead, instead of relying on, continuing to rely on that grace, I mean, he delivered them that far. I think he's really not going to give them water. He's gonna really going to allow them to, to die of thirst in the wilderness after all that deliverance. Well, what was it all for? And so they, again, they complained against God. And, and again, it was more than just a complaint. They they were really putting him on trial because the subsequent um, statements say there. And so after Moses did that, again, another even after they complained, God showed him another act of mercy by throwing in the, making the water sweet. But then God says uh, that there he made a statute, and that word for statute uh, means like a, a law, a, a, bound, a, a commandment, something to bind. So there he made a statute and an ordinance, and the word for ordinance there is a judicial verdict for them. So there he made a statute and, and, and a ordinance for them. There he tested them, and the word for tested there means trial, like to put on trial. So, because they put God on trial, the law lay, law always boomerangs back on top, back to you. If you're if you're not going to walk by grace or rely on His grace, you're under law. You're becoming an enemy, and so they put God on trial. So now God's putting them on trial, and He says, 
if you diligently heed the, 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 the voice of the Lord and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I have brought on the Egyptians. For I am the... <laughs> That's interesting right there. They could have said... Because uh, Lisa said, yeah, you know, at Sinai, he said, back up. You know, the law brings about hostility. Back up. You, you, know, you know, it's not welcoming. Whereas grace is welcoming. It's, it's peace. Whereas the law is hostility. And so you back away from it. You you don't you're not you're not it's not welcoming. And in fact, even in Revelation, it even says, "Come, give her once the water of life. Come freely. It's welcoming." Um, but again, if you're under the law, it's uh, it's foreboding and it's not welcoming at all. And again, they should have said right there, "Oh, why are you treating us like if you're part of the diseases on which I brought the Egyptian? Why are you treating us like our enemies? You just delivered us from." They should have realized that they they'd fallen from His grace, but they didn't. And I kept seeing that pattern all through Scripture. Because even even the disciples of Jesus had to learn that lesson again. Because uh, in John 6, this is really interesting. Uh, it says, John 6, verse 4 says, Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews was near. Then Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming toward him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that, that these may, may eat? But this he said to test them, for he himself knew what he would do. And then guess what Philip said? So Philip was again wasn't relying on God's grace or God's strength to to provide food and sustenance and life. He instead again flipped right back to his own flesh. And Philip said, Philip answered him, two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may have a little." One of the disciples, Andrew, Andrew Simon's Peter's brother, said to him, "There is a lad who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what, what are they among so many?" So again, um, they got Jesus tested disciples, and, and again wanted them to realize, "Hey, I, I want you to rely on my strength, not not your own, not your own um, abilities." So I thought that was really interesting. I, what I don't understand, you guys, is time after time, God showed the nation of Israel His provision, His protection, His supernatural intervention. Why did they never come to the point where they said, you know what, based on his past actions, I think he's a trustworthy God. And if this water is bitter, can we not just cry out to the Lord? We know he'll answer our prayer. Nobody did anything like that. It was constantly, uh-oh, we're going to walk by sight some more, another obstacle. Oh, God's going to forsake us this time for sure. It's like there's nothing in God's past for them to think that he would forsake them or not care for them. So I, it's amazing to me, every obstacle they came up against, it's like they didn't see God at all, that they had no prior information about God or his behavior. It, it just blows my mind seeing it. No matter the, the obstacle he always provided, he always took care of them. But instead of coming to him and saying, you're a good God, we know based on how you've treated us, uh, just, can we just not praise him and ask him to help us? Instead, every time they accused God, it, it this is just amazing to me. And uh, I like that Ben brought up the bitter waters. It is a representative of our situation until the cross is applied. And of course, the tree represents the cross of the Lord. The moment the wood touched the water, it became sweet again. And uh, of course, they didn't know that then. But it does anybody else look at that and go, these guys, as a group, as a whole, as a nation, never once said, God is good. Look what he's done for us. Of course, he'll help us. Let's just, okay, the water's bitter. Well, he's, got, he's getting water out of a rock for them. He's raining bread down from heaven. He's parting the sea when their enemies are after them. I, I, I don't know why nowhere do we see them flat out saying, okay, well, we got better water here, but our God is great and he's proven himself over and over again. We don't see that once. Yeah, and yet I, I wouldn't even, a lot of, I wouldn't get it, put us off the hook either because I, even myself, I'm not, again, I'm, I'm I'm indicting myself here. You know, anytime we fear, uh, are we not really doing the same thing? Um, yes, saying, of course. Exactly. Yeah. I was just about to say exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah because anything that's not faith is sin. 
And when we don't operate in the faith, we're supposed to live by the faith of the son of God and we are justified by faith. So if we don't walk in faith, we, we are not walking according to the spirit. The only way you can walk according to the spirit is in faith and in the finished work of Christ and what he has done for us. That is our firm foundation. And that's what keeps us from returning to the works of the law for any sort of justification. Every one of us are, are guilty of panicking or worrying. Every one of us have, have walked by sight and not by faith in our life. My point is as a whole, these people witnessed the miracles. Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Every one of us did not see and still believe. I just, I'm blown away by what they did see and still did not believe. You know, I, I often said I can't accuse people because I don't know how I would have been then. And I'm guilty myself here. Uh, of the same sin. It just amazes me as a nation, the things they saw and witnessed with their own eyes and still had that attitude. It just blows my mind. Well, you're not, you're not the only one that your mind is blown. Uh, I've often thought about the same thing. How is it possible? I mean, the, look what Israel went witnessed uh, that, uh, God did all these miraculous signs and wonders, even in opening up the Red Sea uh, so that they could uh, escape uh, Egypt. And then even after seeing all of that, look what they immediately did. First opportunity, they, they, they de decided to make an idol. Uh, uh, yeah, I've often wondered the same thing, Renee, but the, the thing is they continued demanding signs even though the signs really were not enough for them, I guess. But Jesus says, here's the sign I'm going to give you. And this is it. This is the ultimate sign. This is the proof. This is what changed everything. Because remember, be, before the resurrection, the apostles, even though they had witnessed all the miracles that they saw, they were still hiding out in, a, in fear for their lives. Uh, and, and it took the resurrection uh, of Jesus uh, as the proof that gave them, okay, now we absolutely have the confidence that now we will even go to our death, and that uh, for this cause, and and that's what gives me the confidence, and that's why I, I've said about that verse, Ben, that we have talked about lately, is that uh, we're we're um, in, with the resurrection that we're or we're how does it again? It could, maybe you could tell me again. I don't know why I can't quote that verse. But it's talking about being justified by the resurrection. Uh, raised for our I, justification. I, yeah, he raised for our justification. And I, I think that the, the resurrection is what gives us justification for believing. In other words, why should I believe uh, all, all these accounts in the Bible, especially the he paid for my sins and raised, raised from the dead uh, and the promise of eternal life? Why should I believe that? It's and it sounds crazy. It sounds absurd. Well, uh, that the fact that he uh, raised himself from the dead, presented himself, and all the apostles were willing to die for that cause because they witnessed it. They touched him. They ate with him, and therefore they, they were absolutely certain. Then, and so we didn't get to see the resurrection, but because of the historical record of what happened. I can have confidence that that he did provide that sign, that proof that uh, faith in him is justified. Um, I also, want, but, but I agree the, the the their cosmic unbelief, like the like the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, all the things they witnessed, its miracles, and still to 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 un, be in unbelief, it just that blows my mind. That was the, one of the greatest hurdles I had myself. Is that okay? How is it possible? But I think part of it is you know we can't discount. I think I think a lot of supernatural stuff in this world, you know, manifestations are limited somewhat, but because of the Holy Spirit, um, and, and, and you know, operating in the world where, where back, you know, in, in Egypt day, they were, uh, you know, they were uh, the magicians had, apparently had some power, um, and uh, again, they they might have believed God, seen all these great miracles like the splitting the Red Sea and stuff like that, but they might have heard or seen other miracles, uh, I, I put that in quotes, miracles from other God, little G gods. And so they, again, they might've thought that God was a God, but maybe not the most powerful God. And so that's why 
they might have uh, gone back into idolatry so quickly. Um, I don't know. I just wondered about those things myself. No, it's true. They remember it, uh, Simon the Sorcerer did things that right. amazed people and stuff. Right. So, very, very yeah. true. Never thought of it that way. That's on. That's awesome. Maybe the veil was thinner. You right. know, people saw these things more frequently than we. I mean, there's people denying there's a spirit world at all at this point. I mean, yeah. Right. Renee, I, I saw in the chat room you said nugs, not not drugs. Sure, not drugs. Somebody was saying uh, uh, fries, not guys. You know, like they like French fries. So I said nugs, not drugs. Yeah, but uh, I'd like to get a nug, but I'm not sure what a nug is. Nugget, chicken nuggets. They were talking about French fries. <laughs> oh. Oh, okay. no, One last. All right. One last quick thing, if I could. I just want right. to reiterate something audibly that I that I typed out in the chat. Again, all of those things uh, that we see in the scriptures of man's failing are an example of how men are fickle, unfaithful, reckless, forgetful, faithless, and why we need a deliverer. Okay? The one who is faithful, the one who is true, the one who never forgets, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, the steady rock, which is he himself upon which he built his church. Christ Jesus the Lord. So all of this was to bring us to an end of ourselves. Man is without excuse. As you see in Romans chapter one, <laughs> it talks about how one of the judgments upon men is that they will not retain God in their knowledge. They're actually rejection, rejecting the very basic morality that lets you know that there is a God. Okay, he's bringing man all to an end of himself. It's all about judgment. It's, it's a choice. Is the choice is Christ. If you don't choose the Lord, you have chosen death. Every false way leads to destruction. There is no salvation apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what from Genesis, the beginning, man's genes, the beginning to the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's all about him. And you are, you are in the middle right now between that decision. That's why I, I can't stand that people have coined this term decisionism uh, and, and mocking the choice that a person has to make. You choose Christ. Jesus said he was not with me, is against me. He was gathered not with me, scattered abroad. You either with him or you're not. And that's what's going on right now. The world is going to have to make a decision. We've already made ours. And we share the gospel to help lead other people to make that decision, which is to choose Christ, the only way to life. Oh, girl, when you said they are without excuse, I was like, all these excuses, atheists say, oh, well, when I see him, I just tell him you didn't give me enough evidence. That mess is not going to stand on judgment. There is a Bible in almost every hotel room. There, at least there used to be until they tried to start taking him out. Uh, there is access to God's word. There, it's You can, if you want to know the truth, it's easy. You can find out. You should at least look at it. But these excuses people make, some of the atheists or people stuck in false religion or whatever, it's tradition, I grew up, you're not going to have none of that excuse. We are responsible for our relationship with the Lord. And he, none of these things are going to hold up. None of them. And I, I think a lot of people are going to, uh, you know, they roll through their life, focus on stuff of the world, not even thinking about where their real life is going to be. In this temporary life we have now, they're so focused on that. And, uh, you know, they all think they're cute and clever and they're going to say something that's going to sway. But there is they will be without excuse. You are exactly right. Well, Sister Renee, all they had to do was look up because the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. That's right. That's why I'm saying these atheists claiming you didn't give me enough evidence. Uh, how about everything you're standing on, breathing, looking up at? I mean, it's just ignorance. You, the, some of the things that they believe that were <clears throat> recently, uh, well, the, the evolutionists have come up with a theory that monkeys got on a raft in order to get to South America. I mean, they will come up with anything other than that God created uh, the heavens and the earth and all life. And they are willing to believe the most ridiculous things when there's no evolutionary chain for the uh, octopus or the squid. They say that eggs came on an asteroid 
and it was through. I mean, you wouldn't believe the stuff they come up with to not believe in God. And that mess is not going to stand. It's just not. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I love it when you two sisters get, you're just on the edge of preaching. Well, I, I got a little more to say, and that is that there is none so blind as those who will not see. They choose not to see because men love darkness rather than light, and they won't come to the light because their deeds are evil. And if they came to the light of Christ, their deeds would be reproved. Amen. Amen. They don't like it. They don't like it. They don't want to be responsible. They don't want to stop doing what they're doing. And once the Lord gets hold of your heart, it don't make you comfortable in it anymore. They don't like it. Right. When Paul said you have turned from from idols to the living God. Right. These little things, these things that they licking all over like ice cream that they love so much is what is going. They're heaping upon themselves. Damnation. God is not doing anything to them. He's made a way of escape. They refuse to take the way of escape. The lifesaver is Christ. If they ain't going to grab the lifesaver, whose fault is it when he has literally set it in front of them, pointed right. it out, shined a light on it, said this is the way and the only way? Whose fault is it? Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. I would say that, uh, Lisa, your um, uh, disdain and, and uh, the uh, for this decisionism that you, you find it repugnant is... Uh, uh, perfectly justified reaction to it. Um, but I, I discovered that um, that term uh, and, and that whole concept uh, is is not, uh, should I be attributed to our old friend that used to be with us? But that really, uh, I, I trace it back to Paul Washer. And, and I started watching some of his uh, sermons on, on decisionism. And uh, so it's really just part of the, the, the washer, the lordship, and the Calvinistic, uh, you know, concepts. But it is uh, sickening that uh, that think that that people are, are, are there's not a choice to be to be made. Uh, what was it? What, what was it? They David said, "Today I choose to serve the Lord." How how was that? Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Yep. That's right. And Jesus himself said, even if you didn't believe him and the record he was given, believe the works. Yep. If you literally look at the physical works and believe that to believe that I am the Christ. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, they do do that because they're resentful that salvation is as easy as hearing the message of Jesus, believing it and receiving it. So they get resentful and say, what do you mean? I done done that. Think you're going to say a prayer and that's it. And you still love your sin. It's just resentment at salvation being by grace and then people like washer are calvinist and they want to believe that any meeny money mo i'm one of the special people that god selected and so i i can prove i'm going to be elect because i'm so righteous so i'm going to make fun of anybody that thinks they made some choice to believe that that's paul washer's mess they're resentful that salvation's by grace through faith and that none of their self-righteous mess adds to it well Not like that but I the the sorry, uh, ahead, the, well, you're quick the, in the garden, for example. Take it back to the garden. You have the tree of life, or you have the tree of life, which is a picture of Christ, and you have the tree of law, or the tree of good and not the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil, which is a picture of the law. And Adam and Eve chose to disobey God by taking of the tree of uh, knowledge of good and evil. And just as we choose to obey God by believing the gospel, so you have the disobedience. Which it which led to unbelief and was an act of unbelief, not believing what God said, um, and then or and then con contrasted with choosing to believe, which is obeying the gospel, which is again a, a, re a reference uh, or a phrase that's used in the New Testament for believing is obeying the gospel. So again, it's it, it is a a, a volitional uh, act, uh, just like at Adam and Eve, they they saw, they desired, and they took, they reached out with their hand. With with uh with for choosing to for eternal life, you you see the truth, you desire the truth, and you reach out with it with your with, with faith and acquire it. Um, so yeah, I, I, that's all I'd say. Well, I see this as a splitting of hairs, and it's very very dangerous, yes. and it is a lot of words that are being spoken, and it is 
um, decisionism. It is, it is um, uh, all kinds, I can't even think of the words right now, but there's words, there's so many words that describe how you somehow twisted the gospel to make it what you want it to be. And, and you're, you're saying that people aren't saved because they've made a decision to be saved, or you're saying that people are from a different camp because they're, um, they're believing in things in a different way, but it's all splitting hairs. It's all the same belief. It's all the same gospel. And this is a a division. And Paul warned us about this, about causing divisions in the church. And this is the kind of stuff that he was talking about. Did I make a decision to, to be saved? I don't know. Did I make a decision? Maybe. Did I did I um decide to accept the, the grace of God as as you know to pay for my sins? Maybe. But you know what? At the end of the day, the bottom of the bottom line is I am saved because Jesus died on a cross and because he rose again three days later. Who cares about all of the words? And that is that's a rant that has been going on for me and a couple other brothers and sisters in Christ that I know of for months now to this the, the words need to stop. <laughs> Just the, the the amount of words to describe how you get saved it's too yeah. much it's a simple yeah. gospel and I when you start agree. adding in a bunch of words it gets crazy and nobody knows whether they're saved or not well i agree with you i think the bible says if there's one commandment believe on the lord jesus christ we are commanded to by god now whether uh, a person thinks they chose to believe on him or god made them believe or i don't care What I care about is, do you believe? Do you trust Christ? Do you know you're going to heaven? Do you know that you have eternal life because of the work done by Jesus on Calvary? I don't care how you think you got there. All I care about is, do you believe? That's it. I, I don't know why this is even an issue and why, even if somebody does think they chose Christ or chose to believe or or thinks God chose them to believe, what difference does it make as long as they believe? What, why exactly how you got there important to me? And why would it be dangerous if a person thought they did choose? And I think at some point when we're commanded to do something, God gives us the ability to do it. So you can either choose to do it or not do it. Now, I, we can't yeah. choose to make ourselves believe something that's not true. I think the evidence convinces you something's true or not. But do we really have to figure out that process? I don't think so. I, I don't I don't need to. I, I don't need to get into that kind of detail and start excluding people because of how they think they got saved or the way they explain how they got saved. I, I don't I, I think that this really is. A place that is just it, it's something that's focused on that's not important and it has caused great division and uh i i think that it, it needs to stop i really do yes, I, I agree and good. this this right here is where doubt comes in because i've heard because just using myself an example as an example for a minute if i've heard that this is wrong and i'm thinking about this in the wrong way and i need to know this much of the bible before i can be saved and i need to know this and that and whatever i can't even think right now it's been a long day but the point is it, that is when you start to doubt because you don't know oh wait a minute did i stand on my right foot when i was getting saved oh no i think i was standing on my left these kind of things is how doubt comes in and how someone can begin to doubt their salvation because there's so many messages out there about the true way to get saved that it's just confusing i i don't think that's an accident heather and and, and a, a very appropriate verse for all this uh that paul would use to rebuke uh such people it says in second timothy two fourteen. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearers. Mm-hmm. It's right there in our Bible. All we have to do is pay attention. But I do want to be an accuser of the brethren for a moment. <laughs> How dare Brother Luke and Renee 
and Sister Heather and Ben, especially you, Ben, and myself. How dare we be whosoevers? How dare we be the ones who actually take the Lord at his word? That in the Gospel of John, <laughs> chapter 3, when the, when the Bible says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent his son not in the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So now we're supposed to believe, this is Jesus himself speaking, who is God manifest in the flesh, who said all we had to do was believe. And we're, how dare we take the Lord at his word? What's wrong with us? What's wrong with us? And you know, if, if to me, every person is responsible for this in their life. And if we didn't have the ability to decide to either come to Christ or reject him, why would we be condemned for it? Why would we be judged for something we're not capable of doing? He told us, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So, uh, of course, I can't make myself believe something. I think I need to be uh, convinced of the evidence. But whether I think that I chose to, I did make the decision to hear the message, to seek out what was going on. And then the evidence did convince me. But I don't need to uh, determine that process for every person. All I need to know is, do they believe? Do they understand what Christ accomplished? And is there trust in that? That's it. That's all I need to know. You know, as an evangelist, I mean, that's what's important. And I, I really love that verse, Ben. Uh, you said it's in, in 2 Timothy. Yeah, and it is whosoever, as Sister Lisa said. And it also says whosoever will. Come and drink of the water of life freely. Yeah. Well, the the we've been quoting Paul, but you know Jesus, uh, he was quite uh, he objected to the the Pharisees' attitude. They had this superior attitude, thinking that they knew more and and they were superior to the, everybody else. But uh, he said, what they're doing is they're straining gnats and swallowing camels. And so that's what that's what we're really referring to is people that are nitpicking and, 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 and just trying to be, uh, you know, dealing in, in minutia. Uh, there there is uh, a certain amount of content and, and, and certain things that we we have to understand and believe. But we certainly don't have to read the entire Bible, become theologians before we can be saved. But uh, I, I said this before, I think last week, but. Uh, in, in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, everybody's uh, talking about verses 3 and 4. Sometimes they quote 1 through 4. Uh, I think the context of what's being really stated there is really the full context is, is 1 through 8. But the, the real point that's being made is that are in verse 1, and that is uh, this gospel, are you standing on it? Is that your stand? In other words, if God asked, me why should i let you into heaven what's my plea what what is my stand what am i presenting on my defense and that is i'm going to say i'm standing on jesus paid for my sins jesus promised me eternal life and uh that, so people can understand and believe uh all the different facts and that you know the historical accuracy of the bible but until they're standing on this gospel and believing that that's why i'm going to heaven then they missed the point. That's right. And I, I was looking because I just went over this verse in my Bible study um, last week. And um, it was it was just so good. And I was like, oh, I need to say that at some point. But I can't find the verse right now. Um, but Jesus said, speaking to his heavenly father, thank you that you have hidden these things from the wise and revealed them to the simple. And that is why to answer sister Lisa's question, that is why who, who, how dare we, because we are the simple, 
We are the broken. We are the ones who needed to hear that we couldn't do it on our own because we already knew that. And God gave us grace to set us free from the law. Praise God for that. Giveth grace to the humble. Mm -hmm. So, Sister Heather, did you ever imagine that your question could, uh, uh, you know, uh, stimulate uh, such a conversation? <laughs> well, I will tell you this. I will tell you this. Y'all know my house is cold, right? <laughs> it's cold in North Carolina right now. So I am sitting in my bed with my heated blanket on, and I'm about ready to jump up out of this bed and start jumping on the bed because the spirit is moving. Amen. Amen. Yeah. It's cold over here too, girl. Right next to you. Amen. Yeah, I know. Um, all right. Well, I don't want to uh, end uh, uh, if you're, anybody has more to say. But uh, if not, I guess we can go to another question. Anybody want to have any more they want to add to this? Oh, man, it's probably colder where you are, baby. I'm sorry. How dare I complain about the cold? Well, <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's 31 degrees right now here in Michigan. Yeah, well, oh, my like, goodness. Well, what are we, 39 tonight, I think? My yeah, sister-in-law said that she had 23 inches of snow. I think she's got a speed. Yeah. My wife says that there's maybe some snow coming to Las Vegas. Ooh. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I guess uh, if we've exhausted the question, let's go to uh, the next question, Ben. All right. It's a, this is another Heather question, so uh, we might have another hour worth of uh dialogue just on, one, on this one so it is uh, i can stop setting them in if you want me to <laughs> no no keep them on your ears are all golden um true or false as christians we need to be aware of what sin is and what it is not so that we don't make god mad at us okay um all right so heather you, you need to go last again but uh all right, who's eager to go first on this one? So what we had to, I, I'm sorry, we need to what so we don't make God mad at us? Yeah, I posted it in chat, but it, it is, again, as Christians, we need to be aware of what sin is and what it is not so oh, okay. that we don't make God mad at us. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess since uh, there's a hesitation, I'll go ahead and give you a short answer. Uh, um, and the, uh, I can't quote the verse, but, uh, you know, the, the Bible does tell us that God's not angry with us. Uh, it, 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 there's been reconciliation. Uh, and so um, even though uh, it is important for us to understand what God, uh, how God wants us to live our life. And when we depart from that, uh, maybe that's a broader uh, definition of sin. But uh, when when we do get out, out of the line, uh, uh, we need to understand that because there will be consequences and perhaps even chastisement, but not because God's angry angry with us. Uh, we're, we're forgiven, and and now uh, the relationship between God and man is uh, restored. Uh, as long as you, uh, it, it makes it possible for anybody to have this relationship with Jesus if that's what they want. Um, okay, who wants to go next? Yeah, uh, we are not sin conscious. There's too many Christians running around. Is that a sin? Is that a, just sin conscious? We walk by the spirit. We are Christ focused. Everything is Jesus, knowing we've been reconciled to God. And his grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. That's what grace is. That's why it's ridiculous to call grace a license of sin. Not one Christian believes that's what grace is. It's some cloak of iniquity. So I don't think it's necessary to study sin and what type of sin and what might be sin because we don't do that. That's what the law is. Uh, and chastisement is corrective teaching. It's it's for the 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 whole point of it is restoration and correction to uh, protect. Uh, if my child is chastised, it's to protect him from the action growing larger or repeated. Thus, uh, a negative consequence occur in the future. So I would say absolutely false. We do not have to keep in mind what's sin and what's not. No, we walk by the spirit. The spirit of Christ dwells within us. We know when we're doing something 
that when the Lord wants us to do something more. And, and I've said before, Christians have a higher standard than the law. We don't uh, want an eye for an eye. We forgive our enemies. We pray for them. We do greater than the law commands. And so the spirit always guides us in that way. And we can always tell because our flesh won't want it. Our flesh will want to get even. Our flesh is going to want to tell somebody off. Our flesh is want to get revenge and put them in their place. But God's voice will hear that still small voice when that, all that anger comes down of how he wants us to deal with it. How, how he can use that moment to touch another and bring them to himself. So I, I don't think the focus should be on sin at all. Sin was dealt with, uh, dealt with on the cross. It was nailed to the cross. And we don't need to keep focusing on it. It's not being held against us. As a matter of fact, sin consciousness is an evil conscience in Hebrews. Anybody that thinks sin is still being held against them on judgment day after Christ shed his blood, it's an evil conscience. It, he wants us to have a heart and full assurance of faith, knowing that his blood purged our sins and they won't be held against us. Uh, and I, I did a video years ago called God ain't mad at you. You know, we're, we're his children. And once you've been born into his family, he wants the best for you. He wants to guide you. And we all have a responsibility as ambassadors for Christ. But it's not in the way that religion tells us so that God won't dangle us over hell or God won't do something horrible to us. Um, Jesus took that punishment and that wrath upon himself. Uh, as Paul would say, shall we sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. We died. We died to sin. We died to the law. And we're alive in Christ. And so the focus every day should be on Jesus and what he's done for us and the great hope set before us so that we can walk in gratitude, joy, and peace. That's the way we're supposed to walk. And that's the focus we should have. Amen. I, I think that uh, I one of the truisms, as a matter of fact, several of the truisms uh, came from uh, uh, me listening to Sister Lisa. And I, I believe that you're the one that said uh, salvation is not a sin issue. It's a son issue. And so that's really what it boils down to. We should be sun conscious rather than sin conscious. If we're focused on Jesus, we're not going to be focused on, on sin. But Ben, uh, several people in the chat room are asking for the question again. So is it possible for you to put the question in the chat room, even if you can't add the link? Yeah, I did. I did once already. I'll do it again. You did? Well, no yep. one seems, I, I'm not ever seeing it I'm, for Let's some reason. Here. Uh, maybe because it has the word true false in it. Okay, it almost says it like a colon or something in the uh oh yeah, it's there now. It's yeah, oh, yeah. it's there. So it's God expected no. no oh, I got the wrong one. Sorry, wrong one. Uh one second. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry, here we go. One yeah. second. And if you keep if you keep making these mistakes, we might have to cut your pay. Yeah, I know. Worried about that, or at least give him a breathalyzer. <laughs> <laughs> for, okay, uh, for too well, much root beer. I only meant root beer. Uh, well, Sister he, Lisa, we have truly <laughs> missed you. So while, uh, Praise God. While Ben's uh, posting that uh, question, uh, let me see. Uh, Lisa, did you? Uh, Renee and I. No, I didn't answer yet. I didn't answer. Um. True, false, God is fit. No, that's the old one. I, I, I got, you were saying uh, basically about being, should we, we have to remember our sins or know that, I, I don't say it's a bad thing. I mean, if, listen, there are some pagans out there that get saved and they don't even know what's wrong. Now, true, if you're led by the spirit, the Lord is going to convict you as to what's right and what's wrong. Absolutely. I was, I was uh, Sister Renee and I had a good talk about this one day. When a person is born again, you don't even really have to know what sin is. Okay. The Holy Spirit will begin to convict you. So I wouldn't be worrying so much about trying to figure out what's sin and what's not. Now, when you see it here laid out in the Bible, we don't dispute it when we see it. But our goal is not to be sin conscious, but rather sun conscious. Because in doing so, 
we keep ourselves aright. We keep ourselves right thinking. We keep ourselves on the narrow path, okay, when it comes to sin. Uh, but when, you know, I could, we could all go through and pull out all the lists of the different things that are sin and give you a list. That doesn't make it easier not to do. But when you are empowered by the Holy Spirit, I don't have to have the list and I won't violate any of them if I'm being led by the Spirit. So, you know, these legalists put the emphasis in the wrong place. And that's why people end up shipwrecked in their faith because they're focused on the wrong thing. Have you have you ever I'm trying to remember what it was exactly that I was doing one time. I, I don't remember if it was uh, riding a I think it was riding a bike. And it was, it was when I was first learning and I was trying to avoid a, a, a fence that was alongside me on my left. But the more I tried to focus n not on the fence, the more I actually leaned into the fence and ended up hitting the fence because I was focused on it. Had I diverted my attention from the fence completely and focused <laughs> my direction on staying straight and where I wanted to go, I wouldn't have crashed into the fence. So, you know, it, this is the thing that you have to do. Christ is our focus. If I'm staying focused on Christ, I'm, my attention is not going to be on sin. My direction is not going to be on sin. My thoughts are not going to be turned towards sin. My thoughts are going to be on him. My direction is going to be him. How can that ever lead me astray? So that's all I have to say. Okay. Amen. Yeah, I still don't see the uh, actual question posted, but uh, read it again, Ben, and then answer it, please. All right. Here, right now it's posted. Um, true or false? God, ex oh, sorry. Uh, that's right. It's not showing there. That is weird. What's going on? Maybe you just uh, have to, maybe you have to go the, the old fashioned way and type it in. Are you hidden? No, it's just YouTube. I think is is, is uh, doesn't like think like I had the word col I had a colon in it, and I think the colon YouTube thinks it might be like an address like HTTPS. Maybe it, maybe it doesn't want you to put to uh, paste. Maybe pasting is the problem. Maybe you have to actually do it the long way and type it. No, in. I, I see it now. It's posted now. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So read read it for everybody, and then okay. You can here answer. it is again. True or false? As Christians. We need to be aware of what sin is and what it is not so that we don't make God mad at us. All right, Ben. You'll be address it? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, well, I don't want to detract from anything that anyone said. I totally agree with with everyone what everyone said. The, the Holy Spirit, no, you know what's sin. However, um, you know, sin is not simply a violation of a written law code. It, it's the spirit of the law. And so, like, for example, there's a couple of verses that touch on this. Romans 14, 23 says, But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, but he does not eat because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not of, from faith is sin. Um, and condemned there just means judged. It, it, you know, for a believer, it's temporally, not eternally. Um, uh, and... Even then, it might not. You might you might not receive that judgment um, in this lifetime. You might be, might see it at the at the judgment seat of Christ. But um, again, whatever is whatever is not in faith is is sin. Uh, and another verse says, First John three four says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. So First uh, uh, John five seventeen says says all righteousness is sin. Um, and then finally, in James four seventeen. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. So, again, whatever is not in faith is sin. And I think um, we, you, you know, I don't think it's, it. I, I, you know, again, I'm not detracting anything from what anyone said. I think you guys kind of answered it from the perspective of, um, you know, should we re read the Bible, study all the laws, so to make sure we don't, we don't step out of line. I don't think, I totally agree with you guys in that respect. But I think... Um, you know, we, we know it. We get a check in our spirit, as Lisa says, whenever we're doing something that's not in faith. So if we're wavering on something, like not sure that God would approve of this or not, it's better that we don't do it, even if it is perfectly acceptable. Um, if it if it's if it's not in faith, we shouldn't do it. And if we do live in heart, if we don't, if we again, if we're walking in the spirit, we won't sin at all. That's the solution for not. If you're worried about sin. Well, there's an easy there's an easy way to, to deal with that, and that is put your eyes on Christ, focus on, on things of the spirit, not of the flesh. 
and and there but there are examples if pe for people who are live in prolonged carnality you know stubbornly pr proudly um like you know the, the person in uh, first Corinthians 5 5 was sleeping with his stepmother or, or mother um he was cast out of the church uh you know getting drunk at the Lord's Supper and uh you know gorging yourself on the food ahead of other people that that uh led to temporal discipline uh even unto death that's a possibility I've been studying first first Peter 4 quite a bit lately and there's a lot in there I, I've uncovered but one thing that uh Paul emphasizes there is you know hey you lived enough time uh you lived enough of the time as Gentiles and the things that they did um and so now you should no longer live that live that way because the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God and if it begins with us first well what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel and he kind of uh, clarifies by saying and he, he uh, uh, quotes proverbs 11:31 he says now if the righteous one is scarcely saved where will the ungodly and sinner appear and the word scarcely saved basically means you know barely or it basically saying god's not going to let us believers just do and get away with whatever we want to do there there are a time when he needs to uh, chastise us um and so in that sense, he might be, he might consider he's mad at us or, or wants to correct us. But it, from a eternal perspective, no, he's, he's no longer be at peace with the guy, no longer mad at us. Um, but with regards to that Proverbs eleven thirty one, I thought that was interesting that first that Peter quoted that because if you read it in full in the Old Testament, it says, "If the righteous will be recompensed on the earth, how much more the ungodly and the sinner?" So. Again, the righteous is our believers, and if we're recompensed on the earth, that's our, that's our, um, you know. Again, I think it's it's a, it's an illusion to, um, you know, if if we want to live a, a long life, uh, you know, not guaranteed to us, but we should we should live a, a life of faith and walking in the spirit. And, but if we're not going to uh, and refuse to do that, and walk in hardcore carnality for an extended period of time and not receive the correction that the lord is giving us and he definitely definitely will show you that i think he slowly amps up the uh the discipline turns up the heat so to speak uh and if you don't respond to that he could, could take you home early um but again all that recompense uh is on the earth that discipline is all done on the earth and so it's uh our time on the, in this earth is really to glorify god and earn rewards uh by doing so and serving others um but if we ref again refuse to do that and live in a hardcore carnality for an extended period of time i think god will uh you know turn up the heat and uh discipline us so in that sense he could be mad at us but um well i'd, I'd like to follow up then on okay. for a question for you that uh, uh i'm sure someone can tell me where the verse is but there is a verse that says god is not angry with us anymore uh and uh to uh, represent that that uh, God's chastisement equates to being mad at us, I think is a mistake. Uh, if, if as a father, uh, you know, disciplining our ch children, we we can discipline the children without being angry. We we're doing it be not because we're angry, but because we need to teach them a lesson. Uh, so I I think it'd be a mistake to interpret it that yes, God's actually mad at us. Uh, I think someone can help us out and there is a verse that says god's not angry with us anymore but uh so ben if you want to elaborate and further and if anybody can help me by telling me where that verse is i'd appreciate it well again i think there's different words um like for example i would uh, for, from a uh, like for example the people at ges grace evangelical society like zane hodges bob wilkin they hold to the fact that romans for example is not a book necessarily about uh the gospel as much as it is about how to believers how for how to for believers to escape god's wrath temporally and i i reject that that's god's wrath is his burning anger like there's different words for anger so there's different words for mad if you will so i don't want to split hairs uh over again rest battle about words um but uh, again uh what do you want to call it mad or upset or disappointed or I, again a father son relationship i think oh, god's an emotional God's whether an emotional mad, person. Whether it's mad or angry, or you want to use a different word, to me, the uh, the real uh, heart of that question is: uh, Should we think that God is mad at us because of sin, 
or not. And, and I, as I said, I'm sure that there's a verse uh, that, that says God's not angry with us anymore. But uh, I only think about the Romans, the Romans one that uh, m much more now being justified by his blood, we're saved through by saved from his wrath through him. Um, and I think there's one in First Thessalonians, we're not appointed to wrath. Mm -hmm. But I can't find the one with anger. There's a lot of them in Psalms about he, he will. Uh, he will turn from his fierce anger and his fury. Um, and then in Isaiah, you know, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. And uh, this would have to be something, uh, one of the uh, Paul's uh, letters, I would think, uh, rather than the, the other books. Uh, doesn't, anybody, doesn't anybody recall? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm about 99% certain of this, that, there's a verse that specifically says God's not angry with us. It seems familiar, but I, I can't find it off the top of my head. Okay. Well, again, I, my, I, I would take that as, uh, you know, eternally. Not, I think God, again, I, I, I don't have to look at the word. I, for, for one thing I will say for a fact, any wrath has, it, God is not wrathful. God's only against uh, people. Under, only the law brings about wrath. We're under the law, so we are not under God's wrath. And that, the word for wrath, there's like three words, like ogre. There's like three variations of it. And so I would, uh, in that sense, I would never say God is angry at us. But I, I think uh, he could, again, he could be, um, I'd have to start it out more. But I think, that, again, he, he chastises us. Uh, there's verses that say he's a consuming fire um, that, uh, you know, again, I don't, it, it's not um, judicially angry at us, but from a, uh, you know, a, a fellowship perspective. I know that's another word that's very sensitive. That some people don't like, um, but I, again, a fellowship, I don't take as like a, it's more of an intimacy, like a type of thing. Um, uh, so again, from that perspective, I would say God's angry at us, for, but if, eternally, but I think it, it, in time he, it, he could be disappointed or uh, I don't know what the word you want to choose, but, but I, I am interested in finding that verse you're talking about Luke. Mm-hmm. I'll search for it, but okay, let's have, uh, let me, has, everybody, has everybody answered except Heather? The, the, the verse in Isaiah, Brother Luke says, for the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee. Neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed. So once the, you know, the new covenant's in place, uh, it sounds like that's done. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I, I, I don't have what you're looking for, but that was a good one too. All right. Well, I'll, I'll try to find it. Go ahead, uh, Heather. Why don't you answer the question? All right. And before I do, um, I just wanted to point out, I don't know if this is what you're looking for or not, but um, Ephesians 5, uh, 4, I'm sorry, Ephesians 4, um, 25 through the, through the end of 4 um, is talking about um, to be angry but sin not and it's and it's talking about um even you know not not grieving the holy spirit um so i mean that might tie in with what you were trying to get to i don't know but i i just figured i'd give you that to look at later maybe that's what you were thinking of but um it does it does talk about um god's anger in that a little bit but anyway um and I just lost everything I was going to say. Um, but, uh, oh, I do want to say, though, um, Sister Lisa, you were spot on with the, if you're looking at sin, that's when you're going to sin thing. Because um, when I was about 30, I was, and it's ridiculous, but I didn't have a driver's license and I was riding my bicycle back and forth to work five miles. And I'm very, very afraid of large dogs and very, very small dogs. Um, but there was a very large dog that was chasing me. And I was looking at the dog behind me and I looked at the curb knowing that it was there and looked back at the dog trying not to hit the curb and hit the curb face planted and ended up using a whole mess of Mederma to try not to scar. But yeah, it, it was bad. But um, so I totally agree that if you're looking for it, you're going to fall in it. And everybody's comments were really really good um 
my my thing is this i spent 18 years chasing god around grace chasing jesus around the throne of grace thinking that i had to repent of every single sin that i ever committed because that's what i was told i needed to do and i realized in 2017 that there was absolutely no way that i had the energy to run even one more step so I flipped through YouTube and ended up finding long story short, I ended up finding Renee's channel and the mess, the basic message was sit down, rest in God's grace. Jesus already did it. Any mad at you that God had for you, he put on Jesus. And so he's not mad at you anymore. And if he were, he'd be mad at Jesus because we are clothed in the righteousness of God does that mean that we won't get chastised? Absolutely not. Because if we are dragging Jesus' righteousness through the mud and rolling around in the mud and getting our, our beautiful white robe covered in dirt, then yes, we're probably going to be chastised in some way or another. And sometimes it's really, really severe, like Ananias and Sapphira trying to lie to the Holy Spirit and god zapped and they were dead they were sent they were taken home they did not lose their salvation because i do believe that they were saved because they were part of the church but they were taken home and does can can god still do that yes he can will he do it it depends on you but the bottom line is you will always still be saved once you've been saved it doesn't matter what you do in your life and that is not to say, go out and live your life like hell while you're here, because that's not what we're meant to do. What we're meant to do is to rest in the grace of God and the Holy Spirit will convict us when there's something that's that's wrong. You know, if you look back and you um to to shepherds and 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 you know, like the old testament, the way that they did, these shepherds would carry a staff that they carried in their hands. And, you know, I always imagined the, the sheep gets out of line and gets a little pop on the on the rump or something. But that's not what it is. I have chickens and I used to have roosters. And when I had my roosters, I did not do this out of fear, just saying. But I always went into the chicken coop with a staff in my hand. Why? Because roosters are dominant and they will attack. It's not a matter of, well, maybe mine is nice. Maybe mine won't do it. Roosters will attack, especially if they do not understand your, your motivations. So when I would go into the chicken coop, I would keep my staff between me and the rooster because I knew he was the one that was about to mess up. And if he came near me, I would give him a little nudge with my staff, gently push him to where I needed him to be. I never hit him. In fact, the only time that my staff ever did anything remotely angry at one of my roosters was when it flew out of my chicken coop and was going for my, my child. And I put my staff in the air. The rooster caught himself on my staff and I threw him back in the chicken coop. Was he hurt? Probably. But he was still my rooster and I still loved him. This is this is just, you know, when we talked um, about does God speak with you, speak to you last week, this is the kind of things that I'm talking about. Yes, God speaks to me. He gives me examples through my everyday life. He gives me examples through homeschool, through raising children, through um, through raising chickens, through gardening. That's how God speaks to us. And, I, and yes, he speaks through the, the scriptures. Absolutely, he does. But more often, it's these everyday examples where God shows us who he is and what his personality is and how much he loves us. He's not mad at us trying to hurt us. He would never take our sin and put it back on us because it was all put on Jesus. And if you're walking around worried so much about, is this a sin? Is that a sin? Is the other thing a sin? And that's exactly what you're going to be doing. Because you're like, oh, maybe I should avoid this, but then it becomes a temptation and you fall into it.
And it happens every single time. And that's my experience speaking. I, I wanted to address this. Um, there seems to be some confusion. Now, I, I am not a person uh, that believes God makes people sick and, and everything that happens, earthquakes, it's God's judgment. I think it's just a fallen world. I also believe that there are just natural consequences that come with our actions. But I do see scripturally, and I cannot ignore them, where people got drunk on the Lord's Supper. And there, he said, many are sick among you and many sleep. So some had died and some were sick because they weren't treating the body and blood of the Lord with respect. With respect. So I do see that they're in the Ananias and Sapphira. I, I do believe they were saved. And I think it was temporal earthly consequence as an example for others to fear. Um, but I, I believe, I don't believe God's mad at us. I don't think he's uh, holding our sin against us on judgment day that we're blameless in his sight. But there are uh, situations in which Paul is saying uh, to, you know, because the grace teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and that uh, we haven't we haven't learned these things of Christ that we're not supposed to live like the world does. And I, I do believe there are consequences for it. I am not a person that goes around saying God beats up people and makes them sick. And we never know if it's God or if it's not. And I don't think it's our place to say that to somebody. I, I think it's cruel. It's been said to me when I was sick that God must be doing it to me. And I it's wrong. But I have to admit that there are situations in scripture where a believer, a clearly saved believer, suffered uh, sickness and even death. So I, I can't ignore those things. And that was a conversation going on uh, with Mike in the chat. Yes, I believe chastisement is God's correction. And it is not going around beating his sheep. There is a difference between struggling, making a mistake, and just overtly denying and quenching the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about quenching the Holy Spirit uh, time after time. There, there is consequence for it. Yeah, when I when I said mad, I guess the word I was looking for was displeasure. I think he could be displeased with uh, believers at times for the behavior. You know, not like he's going to hold back any blessing or looking to, to to take them out. You know, at, at the earliest opportunity. No, it's all about correction. Uh, that's what chasing is about, about child correction, essentially, um, so that for our growth. Um, but I believe, again, there, there are those things that we do. Um, there are things that we, that we can do to d displease God. So, for example, in Hebrews, for example, one of the things I think that things that would displease God the most is uh, someone who turns back, who, who, who rejects, who goes, to, goes into apostasy and is, is uh, very vocal about it and defiant about it. Uh, it says that anyone, you know, my righteous one um, shall live by faith. But if that righteous one draws back, um, I have no pleasure in him, in his life. And, and again, it's it, it, I have no pleasure in his life, his temporal existence. It, it, I, I'm not going to, I'm not taking any pleasure in what he, how he's living out his temporal existence. I have no pleasure in that. Um, so in that sense, I would say he's mad. I mean, I don't mean like, uh, like he's holding back. Um, Hold back and look it out to get you. I, I I hope I didn't come off as that. Um, so yeah, and I, I knew right from the beginning that the choice of words was critical. Um, and so, uh, you know, we all need to show each other a little bit of grace here. Look, I good. think I think the word uh, disappointed would be uh, um, more appropriate. I you said know, that. I, I ser well, that's why I'm repeating it back to you, I'm agreeing with you. Okay. Uh, the. Uh, uh, I, I searched and searched for angry, and I cannot find it. So I, I what I think I've done is I've probably taken the verse, uh, let me see, Renee, I think you probably have the verse that had in mind, or maybe it's one like this, but <clears throat> you said we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You didn't cite the verse address, but I, that that's a verse. <clears throat> so we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, probably what I did was I've taken that verse or a verse like that <clears throat> and uh, amplified it in my own words that, well, that, that means that God's not angry with us you know, if we if we have peace with God, because I can't find any verse in there that says what I, I thought. 
Um, but I do think that uh, God is not angry with us. Uh, we we are we have reconciliation and, and peace. So how do we uh, how do we interpret the this uh, idea that uh, well if we we sin how does God respond to that? And I think He would be disappointed, and He He will uh, choose to chastise us. But I I agree with Heather that I, I look at it as uh, the Jesus being the good shepherd and, and having the staff, he doesn't beat the sheep with the shaft, with uh, the, his staff. What he does is he uses the staff to steer his sheep. If they're off course, he will use it and direct them to get them on course, um, rather than you know uh, you know corporal punishment. Um, all right, let me see, Elisa, you haven't said much on this. Do you have any more you want to add? Oh, uh, let's see. I did post that same scripture. Where was that at? It was in, let me find it here. First John. No, wait, hold on. The one that you were just quoting, no, Romans 5, five 4. Therefore, being justified by faith. Sister Renee did post it first, though. Uh, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. But yeah, you know, um, the only other thing, uh, as Sister Renee was saying, there is temporal judgment. <laughs> and this is why we're still supposed to have that reverential fear of the Lord. And I've often used that example. You know, we don't want to become fam familiar, even though we're family. <laughs> Uh, we need to remember he is the Lord. And you will see that, for example, in the book of the Revelation, that even the glory of God upon an angel caused John to fall on his face and want to worship the angel. The glory of God was just so magnanimous. An angel says, see thou do it not. Worship God. Okay. But that's how, how just the power of the glory of God reflecting off that angel. <laughs> was enough to make mm -hmm. an average man want to worship <laughs> the angel himself. So we should still have that reverential fear of the Lord. And I've always looked at Ananias and Sapphira as an example of the Lord is demonstrating he's the same God that's in that old covenant and he's not to be played with. And they were going to lie or were attempting to lie to the Holy Spirit before the congregation and before the Apostle Paul, who is full of the Holy Ghost. And the Lord's letting them know, I'm the same Lord. Don't play with me. <laughs> so there is temporal judgment. There are judgments. Sometimes people do. Listen, y'all, not everybody is doing the will of the Lord. And sometimes the Lord, you don't, what you don't see is the admonishments that he may have given somebody 150 times to stop doing something. And he's warned them and warned them. And, you, and, and usually it's something that's very egregious, like adultery or fornication or something of that nature. And he's been dealing with them and dealing with them and dealing with, and they won't stop. So sometimes people get sick because of that. Now, that doesn't mean in every case, let me tell you, I'll give you another example. People get sick, <coughs> excuse me, when they're walking in faith and it's an attack from the devil to keep them from moving forward against his kingdom. That's another thing. So we can't, we don't have the right to judge that. I would never presume if I saw a believer and they were sick and they said, please pray for me. I'm not going, oh, they must have done something. That's wicked. Just pray for them. Why? The Lord is the judge of that thing. That's not for us to do. Okay, so we just look, we say, okay, our brother and sister needs help. Now, if the Lord is judging them about something, he's going to continue to speak to them about it. So you, you also see another scripture where he talks about, Paul talks about, there be many weak and sickly among you. I posted it in the chat just a little while ago. And many sleep because they were not discerning, discerning the Lord's body. Sister Renee just referenced that. So I, I love the fact that we know that God is love, but we need to understand he's not to be played with either. This is real. This is not a game. This is not a, uh, let me, let me say this. Cause I've been thinking about this all week. Uh, uh, what we are involved in is not a Christian social club. 
it's not just a place to come and be safe, like, uh, you know, going to a meeting like AA or something like that. That's not what this is. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the God of the game. Now, he loves us, and he only wants what's best for us, but he will chastise you. And I keep telling people this. And if this makes you have trepidation, good, because you should. Maybe sometimes, and I don't mean fear. I mean that he's not to be played with. There should be that reverence. He is the Lord. He is God Almighty. He wants to call us friend. But remember what Jesus said, you're my friend if you do whatsoever I've commanded you. So if we get into disobedience, <laughs> then, then we are going to come under chastisement. And, and temporal chastisement can be up to, if it is very egregious and including death. There are people who are doing some very evil things they should not be doing. I don't judge that. I don't look at somebody and go, are they sinning unto death? That's not my business. That Lord, if the Lord ain't told me to speak to them about it, that's not my business. I'll just pray for that person because I have no idea. I don't, I'm not able to see through people to their back collarbone and tell you what's going on in their life. Now, if the Holy Spirit reveals something, he reveals it. But that's very rare, at least in my case. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. There are people who, who operate in the prophetic and have the gift of discernment. And if somebody came to them, they, they are telling them, hey, the Lord is dealing with you because of this. And you know what? It'll bear witness to them that that's the truth because they know he's been dealing with them about it. It's not going to be something that comes off from left field. So, you know, I, I love everybody and I want you to be operating in faith and not have fear. That's what the Lord wants for you. But you also need to understand he is the Lord. And if he is is admonishing you and pulling you and been directing you to leave something alone. Leave that thing alone. I love y'all, but sometimes people want to only accept that there's only love from God and pretend that there's no, no judgment or justice from God. Yes, he took all the sin upon himself, which is why we're supposed to leave it alone and cast it aside and not be involved in it. The Bible talks about this. There's names, things that we, that shouldn't even be named among believers. Why does it say that? Because there was believers that was doing it, and he's admonishing them to stop doing it. So just, just be cognizant of that. There, there should be a reverential fear of the Lord. You ought to be like, God is not to be played with. That should always be in your mind. He is not to be played with. Yet, also know he is your friend. You are a son of God. You are a friend. I wasn't terrified of my parents, but I knew when not to play with them. When I was growing up, if if they were what we would call on the war path, they was upset about something, you didn't go mess with them at that moment. They was dealing with, taking care of some serious business. It's the same thing with God. You want to be standing behind him when judgment falls. You don't want to be in front of him and, and, and be the one that's getting the judgment. And how do we do that? Staying where he wants us to be, staying in our lane, as they say. You know, because there is a time the Bible says, Jesus said it, it's in the book of the revelation of Jesus Christ, that if he comes and he catches you doing what you ain't supposed to be doing, he said he's going to port you your portion with the hypocrites. <laughs> so, so, so just be, that shouldn't make you afraid. It should make you have reverential fear, which is, I'm not going to play with God. He's the real deal. This is not a game. Okay, thank you. Um, I probably would have, um uh, said amen to that you know a few years ago but as i said I, I i see god's chastisement differently than i i used to but that's uh that's your perspective and it's okay um let me see everybody has uh it, you've had a turn and uh it, is there anything you anybody wants to add before we try to get one more question in yeah i i want to say that the it says judgment comes on the house of god first and if we judge ourselves, then God won't have to. But what I see mostly is if a believer just throws it off and says, I, I'm just going to be wicked. I'm going to go against every, you know, whatever. That whole thing is that Satan will destroy them because they're God's people. The door is flung open 
for the enemy to wreak havoc in his life. And so I sometimes I don't think it's God per se doing anything, but just allowing the enemy to destroy. The, what he wants to do is kill Christians. He wants to destroy the witness of believers. He wants to destroy their ability to preach and affect others for the cause of Christ. And he wants you dead. So we don't want to do anything that uh, invites that or has an open door for him to do that. When the man was having an affair with his father's wife and wasn't, you know, they didn't mourn over it. They didn't think there was anything wrong with it. They just let it go on. Everybody, including the outside world. And that was the biggest thing. The unbelievers had seen it and thought it was wicked. And these things, like she said, shouldn't be named among unbelievers, much less believers. And so Paul's answer was turn such a one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that God may save his spirit on the day of the Lord. So I think sometimes these things actually are a way for the enemy to destroy us. And we don't want to do that either. And so we don't want to have the attitude of, Oh, God's mad at us. He's looking at every little thing. He can't wait to hurt us. He can't wait to pour his wrath. Jesus took his wrath for us. They're not being held against us on judgment day, but grace teaches us differently. We are, uh, Victoria was mentioning walking in our identity. And, and the Bible says that, and the fruit of the spirit are these, and it lists all these wonderful things and says, against such, there is no law. So there's no purpose for the law because if you're walking in the spirit, you're only going to produce these good things. Uh, so, you know, I, I want to have a, a healthy understanding of this because I, I don't believe God's waiting to smack around his children or, or beat us up. I do believe he is a loving father that loves us. And if you're struggling with something, he's not going to beat you up uh, until you get it right. I don't believe that either. But I, I'm talking about a believer that is making really bad choices over and over again, giving God a bad name, being a horrible witness. I believe it can invite uh, horrible things on your life. And one of those things is the enemy to strike and destroy. Yeah, I agree. That That's what I was kind of saying. I was kind of trying to emphasize, you know, I know that God, you know, it's not like God... Um, looks on our sin dispassionately uh i i believe that or, or even our good works dispassionately god's an emotional being like we are and um that's all i was trying to say is really is that um the word mad might be more probably more appropriate like uh displeasure or disappointed or or uh upset again not not necessarily uh especially like, like you said already i think it's a very important distinction if god knows that you're struggling against something it's one thing but if you're again if you're being Open, really rebellious, uh, don't really care. Um, it's another, and again, it's not wrathful. Uh, it's just that God needs to needs to chasten us for the good of us and for the good of fellow <coughs> believers, for the health of His church and for the reputation, His reputation, His name. Um, I, I all through the Bible, when I see God getting most um, when judging unbelievers, I'm sorry, judging believers, it's always when they are uh, pride. Pr proud of their sin, um, not responding to his chastisement, or open, openly rebelling, um, you know, defiantly. That's when I see he takes action, and to th and to think that he has no emotion attached to that, I I just I find that inconceivable. Uh, now I I chose I kind of thought of the word mad, but um, I could see how that might be taken the wrong way, and so displeasure, um, upset, etc. So I think we all had great answers. I think that um, Renee's point about it being a public sin, something that's known about that brings reproach on the name of the Lord, I think that yes. is when the, the um, chastisement comes most. Um, if it's just something that you're dealing with privately, I've not seen any evidence in the Bible <clears throat> that you would be openly chastised like that. I agree. Yeah, I, I, have, Go ahead. I think some churches with pastors that are in terrible sin it's because they are in a public place representing his name. I, I would say that um, I, uh, sin, 
um, brings its own consequences. Uh, if if you uh, steal, you may end up in jail. If you uh, uh, commit adultery, <clears throat> it's likely you end up with divorce and broken families and, and sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, we, we're not going to get away with our sin. Uh, so uh, even though it's paid for, you know, in this lifetime, there's still consequences that come with sin. We'll um, find you out. Mm -hmm. uh, let me see. There was, one else was again. There was something else I wanted to say. For now, I forgot. Oh yeah, this word "mad," brother. Uh, uh, it takes me back to about 1970 or 1969. My my first wife. Uh, she was Cuban. And she spoke pretty good English, but you know it was her second language. And uh, I was sometimes I, I had said to her, I said, well, "Why are you so mad?" And and she didn't understand that mad could mean angry. She just thought mad meant insane. <laughs> so she she got even more mad or angry at me because she now she thought I was accusing her of being ins insane. All right, just an anecdote. Uh, yeah, uh, the English version of the England meaning of mad. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I thought we'd have uh, time for another question, but we're getting close to the end. Uh, why don't you read the next question, Ben? Maybe it's something we can do real quick or, or not. Let's let's see. Okay, I'll try to find one here. Um... Not one of Heather's questions. They're too deep. It would require an hour at least. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, okay. Uh, yeah, here's here's one. Um, I think this would be actually a kind of short answer for all of us. It's a long, it's a it's a long question from Heather again, but it's a good one. But I think we we have uh, relatively uh, quick answers. Okay, true or false? Bible verses can have more than one meaning depending on what you need to hear at the moment. For example, Second Corinthians nine seven tells us that God loves a cheerful a cheerful giver. This verse can be about more than money. Okay. <clears throat> well, I, I'll speak on it first because I, I, I've spoken against this I, idea in the past. And uh, I, I think first and foremost, before you even attempt to uh, get any other interpretation, we have to try to determine what was the in, intended um, intention of the writer at the time. Uh, that is really uh, what we should be um, uh Nothing, nothing matters unless we, we got to get that part right at least. Now, are there other spiritual applications uh, that we we uh, can discern from from various verses? Uh, uh, I'm sure there are, but uh, it's it's also kind of risky too, too, because then I think what we're doing is getting involved in what the Bible cautions us about private interpretation. And to me, I. I, I I can't remember what was said about private interpretation recently, but I, I, to me, I, it, the private interpretation is just thinking that you you can take a verse and say, well, this is what it means to me. Uh, well, it might have that meaning to you, but uh, that was not what was intended by the, the author at the time. Uh, if, if, if that's not the case, then it is a, a private interpretation, and we were cautioned about that. Um, all right, who wants to go next? Well, it's almost midnight here. I've got to get some sleep, you guys. But uh, well, we're going to finish up right now. Just give a short answer for this one, and then we'll okay. finish up. Yeah. Um. No. Uh, my short answer is no. It is the mother of all reasons. There's so many denominations uh, because the proper context is not investigated nor applied. And uh, uh, although scripture can have multi levels. Things in the Old Testament that are literal history can also be foreshadows of Christ, um, that kind of thing. They have various meanings there, but a verse has its meaning, uh, especially like in the epistles of Paul. Those verses have their meanings. They can be applied to various things. The principle of that verse can be applied to other things. But no, uh, I do not believe that they can have meanings change based on how I feel the Bible is God's word. It is perfect, and we are supposed to see it for the context 
uh, in which it was written. So I've seen too many secular TV shows, et cetera, taking things like what you judge, lest you not be judged uh, out of context. Uh, like we're not even supposed to judge anybody or judge anything. And that's ridiculous. Um, so, uh, no, I do not believe it. I believe God can speak to us uh, if we're going through something through his word. But verses do not change meaning uh, on how we're feeling. I think we need to read them for what they were meant when they were wrote and written in that or proper context. Okay, thanks. Uh, who who can give us another short answer? I'll go, I guess. Um, I, yeah, I agree that there's only one interpretation, but there can be many applications. So, um, but so getting the interpretation right is critical, and studying the context carefully is critical. Um, I think that's what a lot of people do. They they, you know, that's what the one of the pr core principles of the Bible is to remember, 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 and a lot of people even forget what they read a few sentences before <laughs> until and so when they try to interpret a verse they forget what they just read and they try to trip that interpret that verse in isolation or make it conform to their theological systems um so i believe there's one interpretation but many applications so for example the verse uh that was cited as an example was second corinthians 9 7 i believe it was that god loves a, a cheerful giver well again uh the, the bible the verse there doesn't even suggest uh, that it, I'd read study it more carefully in context, but I don't think that context even suggests anything about money per se. Uh, it, so it would be, uh, you know, the one interpretation is, the interpretation is God loves a cheerful giver. Um, obviously a good, a giver of good things, not a giver of bad things, but, um, the, the application is yes, we, he loves a cheerful giver, whether it be money or time or service, whatever it may be, exercising our gifts that he gave us. That's why he gave us gifts so we can, uh, use them for the good of of of, of others. So, um, yeah, one interpretation, but many applications. Okay, all right, uh, Sister Lisa. Well, I think context should always be king. You got to look at the time period, who he's talking to expressly, who he's speaking to, whether or not it's prophecy. That that has a lot to do with it. Because if something he's speaking is prophetic, he may not, even though he spoke it to the people he's speaking to, it didn't apply to them directly at that moment. It was something for the future. Uh, so all of that matters. Uh, and that's how we get right division. And if we don't do that, we can end up in error. But there is a possibility with some scripture that it applies to both then and now. Uh, there are certain things that are just true regardless of who he was speaking to, whether it was prophetic, whether <laughs> it was for them or for us. So uh, that applies as well. So it requires discernment as well as uh, uh, concerning the context, proper exegesis of the scripture, as well as whether or not being led by the spirit concerning whether or not that even applies to us now. Is it prophetic? Is it something we're still looking for? So uh, there's times I have read a scripture and didn't see something and, and may have read it a hundred times and then reread it again and saw something I didn't see before. And it and it is beneficial. It does, just as the Bible says, all, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profit, profitable for doctrine, for reproof and instruction in righteousness. Even when we look back in the old covenant, even though the example and the mistakes examples. So um, I think it depends on what we're talking about, but that's certainly possi possible and uh, within the realm of possibility and maybe true. So I'll say leading true. All right. Thank you. Um, all right, Sister Heather, what's your final authority on this since you wrote the question? Well, I'm, I'm going to have to have a talk with Sister Lisa later for stealing my thoughts. But um, yes, absolutely. Um, get the context first. Make sure you've got the context. If that means having to reread it, get the context. Once you've got the context, notice how many times I said context there, right? Then all scripture is inspired by God and is profitable 
for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be fully equipped. Um, oh, maybe, oh, goodness. <laughs> you know where I'm going. I, I messed up, but that's okay. It's dark. I can't really see real well. Um, but Sister Lisa already read it anyway, so y'all already heard it. So that's all that you needed. But yes, context first, and then let the Holy Spirit speak if there's something that he wants to tell you about something. See, I'm hung up on the words meaning there because the verse uh, verses don't have different meanings based on how I feel, but they can have a different application. That's what I was saying earlier. The meaning never changes. What's being said by God doesn't change, but applying it to certain situations can. Uh, and I'm I'm fine with that. But I, I agree. You know what I'm saying? I do agree. Yeah. Meaning there is what makes me feel. Eh, there's only one when Paul wrote a letter. The meaning of that instruction was very specific and the meaning won't change. But the application can be broad. Yeah, that, that, that's a very important distinction you, you're making, and uh, the uh, I do think that since uh, we're saying context over and over again, that I, I would ask everybody to consider that context is not only the verse before and the verse after, even all the surrounding verses, even the the chapter or even the the the, the actual epistle itself. The con the the context is uh, even broader in that there is a theme of the Bible. Now, there are certain things in the Bible that are um, uh, cannot be violated. And that that is like the character of God, the nature of God, uh, in the, the, uh, the doctrines of salvation. And these things, when we understand them, then that context has to also be applied to all the verses because we cannot have anything that's going to contradict these, these fundamentals. Uh, so you've got the context of the whole Bible as it's, it's itself. That uh, uh, <clears throat> all right. Um, uh, I guess now uh, there's just enough time now for us to give uh, us our uh, like uh, summary closing remarks. Uh, let me start, Sister Lisa. What what did you think of the time together tonight? I thought it was uh, a wonderful time. I enjoyed the conversation and everybody's ideas. Um, even though we're doing it in the form of true and false questions, because we're always reverting back to scripture uh, as our proof of all matters of faith and practice, we're not just discussing uh, things like off the top of our heads alone and going based on vain philosophies. We're actually re referring to the scriptures to come up with the conclusions that we do. I wanted to mention something before I forget because I wouldn't have another a chance to really do it, which would be to commend you guys for your expository study uh, on Sundays and, and Wednesdays when you're going line upon line, verse upon verse through the Bible, that, that's expository study. And I just wanted to uh, commend you guys for doing that because that is actually the way the scripture is supposed to be studied in context, going through what, what, he's, what he's speaking about, what he's writing about, to arrive at the right conclusion based upon the scripture. So I'm going to take that time. And, and, and we, we do that tonight as well in the form of ironing, sharpening, you know, iron sharpening iron, where we go back and forth about things to arrive at the truth based upon the scripture, because we're not interested in Lisa being right. Although that's cool. I like it when it's like that, but I want to be right because I'm in alignment with Christ, not so I can go, Lisa's right all the time, because then that's pride. And that's not the spirit we're supposed to be in. So when we have the attitude that we want to be right because we're in alignment with what is right, we arrive in the right place and we all arrive in the right place together because we're not, as just mentioned uh, a few minutes before, we're not going by private interpretation. We're going based upon what the scripture is saying in context in the spirit of what is being said so we can be led by the lord to arrive at the right conclusion or summary of that scripture and then keep ourselves aright based on that and i enjoy it, it it's fun we have fun 
uh, teasing each other in, 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 I believe in, in, in good spirit and, and kindness toward one another. And it's, it's fun. It is fun fellowship Friday. I enjoy it. I was looking forward to it all week and I look forward to, to it again, uh, next Friday. And I, I love all of you and, and thank all of you who participated tonight and thank you for your time. And just a quick reminder tomorrow night on late night with Lisa and friends, uh, we're going to talk about some interesting topics. Sister Angel, I uh, wanted to talk about the moon. So we're going to, huh, we're going to talk about the moon tomorrow night. And then also brother Fitz Houston is going to be joining us to talk about his topic. I invited him to come up with a topic and he wanted to talk about uh, the holidays and how it, it affects us and specifically, uh, if I can remember here, let me pull it up one quick second. I want to phrase it correctly. And of course, my phone decided to go buck wild crazy and not cooperate. So I don't remember exactly how it's phrased, but I'm going to put in the title as soon as we get off the broadcast here uh, on what he wanted to talk about tomorrow night concerning the holidays. So I think it's going to be a very good discussion. And he'll be joining us about 10 p.m. tomorrow night. So I hope to see all of you there. And thank you again for joining us this evening. Thank you again, Brother Luke. And blessings to all of you on the panel and everyone out there listening. Land, thank you so much for joining us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Sister. Uh, all right, Sister Heather, what's your uh, summary closing remarks? I think it's been a great study and or a great time together, rather, of great fellowship. And um, I'm I'm very grateful that you guys enjoy the questions that I um, send in. So it was fun. Um, everyone have a blessed um, rest of your week and we will see you Sunday. And I'll let everybody else talk first. OK, thank you. All right, Sister Renee. Yeah, I was uh, glad to be able to join you guys tonight. I, I was so tired Wednesday. I fell asleep in my chair. I didn't wake up till like 9.21. So thank you all for letting me flake out. I just wanted to go right back to sleep. Uh, so I was uh, happy to be able to discuss this with you tonight. And uh, Heather <laughs> sends in the question. We end up talking over an hour on it and i love it when the conversation is organic like that and just unfolds and i saw that the chat was involved uh in what we were actually discussing which is great because i know it's a little more lax on fridays because it's more of a hangout fellowship type thing so it was really nice to see everybody uh the listening to what we were saying and adding to the conversation uh, it was really great to see you all, and uh, Sister Lisa, so happy to see you again. Thank y'all for everything you do, and Ben, thank you for, you know, helping us keep this thing going. I mean, you, we would not be able to perform this duty um, for the saints if you weren't contributing so much of your personal time, and thank you to all the moderators as well. All right. Thank you, Sister Renee. And uh, I think I speak for everybody that we're all very happy that you were available and could uh, join us tonight. Um, Brother Ben. Yeah. Thank you, Renee, for joining in. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, go to sleep now. It's late. Um, but I, I was a little sad. I'm glad Renee could make it, but I, I uh, Steve couldn't make it and Angel couldn't make it, which is kind of a pity because Angel... It was, I was thinking about this lately is that it's been my, it, I'm coming up with my one year anniversary uh, being part of this church. And I know Angel started a couple weeks before me. And so this would have been her uh, one year anniversary. So um, that's, that was pretty cool. But um, yeah, I, I, I had fun as always. And um, I look forward to seeing everyone tomorrow night on uh, Lisa's program. Okay. Thank you, brother. Um, well, I mean, Sister Lisa had mentioned iron sharpening iron, and I think it was an example of, of that tonight. Um, there, uh, in every verse, really, there really is only one right answer. Um, uh, what we, what we should be striving to do is all try to, uh, learn what the right answer is. 
And we can do that on our own uh, to a certain extent, but by working together, our chances are much greater that we can come to the right understanding. And so that's where the iron sharpening iron comes in and is so helpful to all of us. <clears throat> um, I, uh, I was really uh, uh, worn out and really didn't know if I was, I was going to be able to do tonight because uh, uh, I thought I was going to have to just rely on everybody else and kind of not say much. But uh, actually, I had a real good time and uh, so happy that I actually could be part of it again. <clears throat> you know, I, I missed for a while because of being sick, but uh, being back right again is uh, it, it's so that's a blessing to me. It's so important to me. So I want to thank everybody on the panel for participating and everybody in the chat room and particularly uh, thanks to the moderators, the, the deacons in the chat room who deal with uh, any any problems there. And so um, it's, it's all a, a wonderful uh, body of Christ with many parts. And I, I think we're all working together beautifully. So thank you. And uh, we'll see uh, everybody tomorrow night on Lisa's program. And then don't forget to join us Sunday, 5 p.m. Eastern on the same channel for our Sunday church service. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior, God, Jesus.